Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we have the honor once again to speak with El Doctor, Dr. Manuel Pastor, is a distinguished professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He currently directs the Equity Research Institute at USC. Pastor holds a, an economics PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is the inaugural holder of the Turpajan Chair in Civil Society and Social Change at USC. And I meant Turpan. How do you say that, Doctor? It's Turpanjian. It's an Armenian name. It's, it's an Armenian California. name. We know how to pronounce that. Yo hablo español, so I don't get it. <laughs> anyway, my friend, look, uh, it's been a, it's a pleasure to have you on. I think we've had you on a cup a year or so ago during the election period. Is that correct? That's exactly. Yeah. And you know, here's here's something that I want. I, the way I want to start this conversation, you it, it, this last election made you look like a genius. That's all I need to say. Now run with it. Well, I think one of the things that I tried to point out when we talked is that people keep asking, uh, how are Latinos going to vote? As though Latinos are one single group, as though there's not variation by the country of origin, the geography where people live, and their political uh, predilections. And so one of the things I think that came out of this last election that a lot of people were surprised by was the fact that Trump actually improved his standing with Latinos. And it's quite difficult to think that someone who was promising to deport your grandmother would actually wind up doing well amongst your people. But it was predictable because the Trump uh, campaign managed to push, push the socialism button, talking about how Democrats were gonna lead us toward socialism. That was frightening to Cubans, to Venezuelans, to others in Florida. They also managed to push the law and order uh, button. That was actually something that was comforting to uh, Hispanics, which is what they call themselves in Texas, particularly in the borderlands, where yes, they're worried about their undocumented cousins, but their uncle works for the border patrol and they're worried about law and order. And I think the Trump campaign was also able to press the sort of small business entrepreneurship uh, trope, which actually also appeals as well. So it's amazing that someone who was that xenophobic could wind up doing that well. But yes, it was predictable. And thank you, Egberto, for remembering that I predicted it. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, look, when, when I listened to you the last time, I just said, you know, what you're saying is making a whole lot of sense. Now, you know, Latinos, you, they like to group Latinos into one particular demographic. So they like to group everybody into a particular democratic demographic. And I think, we're, whereas I believe in identity politics, doctor, I honestly believe in identity politics because if you don't have uh, if you if you did if you didn't have identity politics, it would say that we are all homogeneous and 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 everything is working fine. However, it has to be played exactly not played. It has to be handled exactly right for what ails that particular identity. Why don't you explain how trying to throw identity politics the wrong way with Latinos will always hurt the Democrats? I mean, look at what's happening in Congress right now. With the way they're trying to pass the, uh, the 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 build back better bill with something that is unlikely to go through, why don't you talk a little bit about that, if you will? I mean, I think the assumption is that because the Republican Party has moved so far in a nativist direction, that virtually every Latino is going to wind up gravitating to the Democratic Party. But people are composed of many different impulses that make part of their right. Identity. I mean, one of the things that you and I talked about during the campaign was thinking, for example, about Black voters. And people were surprised that in South Carolina, Black voters would go for uh, Joe Biden, whereas in California, Black voters wound up going for Senator Bernie Sanders. But those are two different kind of Black voters. Those South Carolina Black voters, they're more religious, they're more traditional. They've seen white backlash, so they're really 
may be more comfortable with a white moderate who they think won't provoke so much backlash. Black folks in California, far more part of a radical tradition. That's, you know, there's a reason why the Black Panther Party was born in California and in its multiracial and more leftist politics. So every population needs to be decomposed by its own political and cultural history. A lot of that is specifically geographic. And that is particularly so for the Latino population. You've got uh, Mexican Americans who identify more as American than Mexican. You've got Chicanos who identify themselves. They may also be Mexican American, but as part of a nationalist resistance to white domination. You've got Puerto Ricans that move back and forth between two locations. You've definitely got Cubans. And again, all of that varies as well by geography. And the big growth in the Latino population has also been folks from Panama, folks from mm -hmm. Venezuela, folks from other parts of Latin America. And because of that heterogeneity, the Republicans have always had a chance. They've blown it time after time. And the interesting thing is going to be whether or not they're able to make further inroads. But it's really clear that when you've got democratic politicians that are talking about the Latinx population, when the only people who use Latinx are young, hip Latinos Thank in you. urban areas who like, you know, go to college and stuff, that it's like you're not really going to make an inroad, you know, when people don't use that term to describe themselves. What got shown in the Bernie Sanders campaign is that if you go to communities and listen to what they're really concerned about, you can make inroads. And that's what I think the Democrats need to do. Dr. Pastor, I'll tell you something. I, 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 didn't even, I wasn't even going to bring up the Latinx part in this particular discussion, but you opened that door. I, I, I think, you know, uh, many a times, <clears throat> many of the folks tend to talk about the Democratic Party as being elitist. We know that it's no less or no more elitist than the Republican Party. In fact, if we take a look at neo neoliberalism, it is a faction of both parties, and I don't know how indistinguishable they really are. But that said, um, what is it going to take for Democrats, or do they even really care to just win 50 plus one, or to really have a governing coalition that meets the needs, not only of Latinos, I mean, the needs of Latinos equi is equivalent and, and I'm talking about fi uh, from, from a, 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 a fixed a economic point of view, from the average, from, you know, I have a term I use. Whenever we unite the barrios, the ghettos, and Appalachia, we would have won. And the thing about it is those in the barrios, those in the ghettos, stereotypical, stereotypical, I know, and those in Appalachia share the same needs. The Democrats seem unable to unite their coalition in those terms and open or cede that spot to a party who cares nothing about those particular policies. Well, the Republican Party is actively trying to divide people and practice dog whistle politics to see whether or not they can stir a nativist reaction and maintain a vote. And you're seeing this right now in the way the maps are being gerrymandered, for example, in Texas, where 95% of the increase in the population yes. has been from Latinos, but they've actually drawn uh, new maps that uh, basically zero out any district where a black person could likely win and actually reduce the number of districts where Latinos can win. So, you know, the GOP can clearly be painted as not the answer. But the problem is that the Democrats have to make sure that they are seen as the answer. And the key thing is that what do Latinos in general care about? Education, better education for their kids, better wages at the jobs that they have, a cleaner environment, because they're often the groups that are the most exposed to environmental hazards, and the opportunity to own a home, build assets, and accumulate some wealth. Those are such bread and butter issues. If you couple that with some promise and 
actually achieving some degree of immigration reform, you could really block the Latino constituency into the Democratic Party in the kind of way that the Black uh, constituency in the United States has been kind of a permanent part of the Democratic Party. But as you can see, Black folks feel like they are taken for granted by the Democratic Party. And Latinos also feel like they're taken for granted by the Democratic Party. But the Democratic Party looking forward needs to understand where the population growth is coming from. And one example, in the last 20 years, the number of young whites, folks who are not Hispanic white, below the age of 18 has actually fallen by 7 million. What does that mean? That means wow. each year there are less and less new white voters. They're both aging out and passing away and you're not seeing an increase in the youth population. In that last same 20 year period, there's been 70 million, uh, 7 million new young Latinos. And each year, about 10 times as many Latinos turn 18 as Latino immigrants naturalize. So that young voting population is totally up for grabs. The Democrats could make big inroads because young voters tend to be more liberal, tend to be open to diversity, and also tend to have very bread and butter issues such as college debt and good jobs in the future but they're alienated, they don't vote, and they're not the target of democratic outreach. This is basically wasted resources for a democratic majority. Now, uh, Dr. Um, Pastor, I, I'm gonna, uh, this is a, this, I'm gonna go into a rather dangerous area now. You haven't been doing dangerous areas already? Well, that's true, I have, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, this, this is interesting because I wonder too often if this isn't by design. I want to give you a postulate certain things. When we, when we were working for something like the Affordable Care Act, that would have pr predominantly helped Latinos, Blacks, and many others. Uh, we had a 60 votes in, in the Senate, and we had a huge uh, overvote in, in Congress. And still we found it difficult to make the Affordable Care Act in such a manner that it really was a people-centric type insurance policy. Now we have two, we broke the infrastructure bill, Build Back Better, and the physical infrastructure bill into two pieces, one that benefits you know whom most of the times, and the other that would be just that, Build Back Better, give people, give people health care, better health care, give people the ability to go ahead and get a job because their kids now have uh, child care, all these great things, and still. Plus universal pre-K, which is incredibly important for low-income families, for their kids to be able to get a start at schooling and then do well when they actually turn into third grade and sixth grade math and reading tests. Magic, magic. And my point here is, doctor, is that all these policies that are easy to attain exactly what you are talking about is the difficult part that Democrats are having to pass. No, we can kill the filibuster for not making the debt go, I mean, by raising the debt limit, we can kill the bill for all these things. But for things that are particular to Latinos and others, it's a big issue. Do you really, and here's a question that I talk about being dangerous, and I really want an honest opinion here. We always talk about republicanism and white supremacy and that sort of thing, or wanting to keep power in certain hands. Could it be that this is really not necessarily a partisan thing as far as the difficulty or the ease with which one could hold on to the Latino vote because you're really seeing that that's where we're heading? Well, you know, that's a hypothesis and we can talk more about it. I think even before we get there, there's just a tremendous amount of foolishness that's going on on the part of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. To build on the example that you're talking about, you know, for the longest period of, what, what is in that bill? What is in that bill is uh, caring for the elderly, mm -hmm. extending health care, 
providing child care, providing universal pre-K, caring for the planet by investing in climate resilience, and a series of other things that might have led us to call that bill an investment in our caring economy. What did it get called instead? Reconciliation. Yes. What the hell is reconciliation? Yes. It's yes. a process word, right? Which suggests that uh, you have no narrative, no message to really appeal to people. And you're talking just about process issues that are interesting to folks in Congress or to political reporters rather than to people in their daily lives. So I think there's a tremendous amount of foolishness going on around the narrative and the messaging that ought to be there to really attract the support that would be possible. Even Build Back Better is kind of tough because so many communities feel like they were left behind and kept behind that when you're saying build back, you're wondering, well, maybe it'll be better, but that whole back thing wasn't working for me. So how do you really shift the message? And maybe that's where you're right, which is that if you were really serious about this, you would really work on the messaging, the narrative, and the political organizing to engage those folks. Let me just give you an example from California where we know the polling data pretty well. This seems to be true at a national level, but it's also true, but it's been proven by about 12 years of polling in California. When you ask Californians, do you care about climate? Do you think that the climate crisis is a very serious crisis that threatens our quality of life and our economy? About half of white Californians say yes. About 57, 58% of black and Asian Californians say yes. Two thirds of Latino Californians wow. say yes. So when you think about the way climate gets messaged uh, as a general concern or something probably mostly white environmentalists care about, in fact, Latinos care deeply about it. Why? Because the climate crisis is associated with bad air and asthma in our neighborhoods because there's a climate gap in terms of who's subject really to heat waves and wildfires and so many of these other disasters. And so what about if the Democratic Party really lifted up the climate crisis as a racial justice issue? Could it have more appeal and it made more constituencies? I think it might. So I think that's where perhaps the big failure of the Democratic Party is, is you've got these constituencies that are really ripe for the taking and then ripe for the cementing into a permanent majority and coming up short. Now, doctor, it is, it is evident that you know what you're talking about. You've already been, you've already called out what occurred in 2016 or rather 2020. But moreover, I think it is clear that, um, yeah, well, it, it is clear what you're saying. Um, and it is clear you've done your research, et cetera. My concern is this. Um, there are a lot of smart people that are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in messaging for a party who's collected a whole lot of money. You called it foolishness. That's what you called it. Is it foolishness or is it some sort of intentionality? Your thoughts? I really, I mean, I, I, you, you hadn't answered that quite, uh, you know, the, the, way, the way I expected to, because I, I, I cannot sit back here, professor or doctor, and feel that these guys cannot be that ill-informed or ill-advised. Why haven't they come to see El Señor Manuel Pastor, who has studied this item? You've been all over the newspapers. New York Times, everywhere else. Why haven't they said, come on our team? Well, there's been a significant underinvestment in Latino mobilization. It's been pointed to over and over again. I think that one of the things that's true, and then we'll just jump into the intentionality piece, is that there's this tremendous 
business of politics where consultants make a tremendous amount of money and repeat things in ways that are supposed to make elites feel comfortable and like things are manageable. And one of the things we know from the research is that if you're, I mean, a couple of things I think happened in the last campaign too, is that Latinos respond more to high touch than high tech. Mm -hmm. So you need a ground game to really mobilize people to get out to vote. Uh, Whatever set of reasons, just text messages and TV is not going to do it. You need door knocking that goes on. Second, uh, you need to uh, actually operate in the world of Spanish. There's a lot of Latinos who are perfectly uh, comfortable with speaking English, who nonetheless get their news from in Spanish. Mm-hmm. Because if you watch Univision, Univision or Telemundo, yeah. Telemundo, a lot of the stories there are things that you and I might be interested in, the immigrant mm-hmm. experience, Latino small businesses. You know, it's just kind of stuff you're interested in that's not being covered in main, quote unquote, mainstream media. One of the problems is that the level of disinformation, not in not only maybe show in Telemundo, but the level of social media disinformation in Spanish is much higher than it is in English. Mm-hmm. And there was no concerted campaign because people who were running these big campaigns weren't listening in Spanish or not speaking Spanish to say, well, we really need to combat this stuff that's saying that Democrats are socialist because they're not saying Democrats are socialists. They're saying, los democratas, ellos son socialistas, ellos van a tomar toda tu propiedad. Exactamente. Y todo eso, right? And what's happening is that if that's not being listened to and combated, you're going to get a lot of disinformation. So, I mean, I know enough Democratic leaders to know that there are people of goodwill who really want to do the right thing. And then there's a lot of people who are engaged in political malpractice. And I think the problem is that for the most part, saying you're frustrated with democratic political leaders and then turning to uh, Jim Jordan and Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, and Kevin McCarthy, yes. it's like a really un- unappealing alternative. Yes. yes. Yes, it is unappealing, completely unappealing. I, I, I can't see it, but uh, we are running uh, low on time, Dr. Pastor. So, um, you know, you've been with me before, you know, the last question I'm going to ask, what would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? I think that we need to focus on young Latino voters, that we need to, there's a great group in Texas called JOLT. And what it's realized is that mobilizing the older Hispanic voter, that's one thing, but getting young millennials who, for example, they might think of themselves as Latino, but they often think of themselves as quite mixed Mm -hmm. because they might have a lot of friends who are white or black or Asian, a lot of them, are much more comfortable with different kinds of sexualities. They're really interested in social media. They're very interested in relief of college debt. They're very interested in what their career is going to look like. I think our real big task is mobilizing young voters. And Egberto, I think that's worthy of a conversation the next time we get together, which is how do we make sure that this conversation about mobilizing the Latino vote doesn't just picture someone my age, but asks the question, how do you get the 18 to 22 year old to participate to look? Because when someone votes in a particular way in their first few elections, that locks them in generally for decades to come. So it's one thing to persuade older people to swing one direction in one election or another. I mean, the gold at the end of the rainbow is getting these younger voters to lock in to a particular perspective and a particular party. And I think that they think very differently and we need to think like they do to get them on board. We have a date 
Another one coming up exactly on that issue. Dr. Manuel Pastor, Professor of Sociology and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. It's been my honor once again to have you with us. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Como siempre, un gran placer. It's always a great pleasure. Muchísimas gracias, señor. Adios. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.